Uh, our next session uh, uh, is something uh, is uh, uh, a topic that I am super super excited about. Uh, it's uh, you know we're going to focus a little bit more of, about AI uh, around AI in, in manufacturing supply chain and so on. Uh, I'd like to introduce both our guests. I'll start with Gus. Gus is uh, uh, you know uh, is a good friend, mentor, advisor. Uh, for me personally, but also fundamentally, he's one of the, I would say, one of the most tech forward CIOs in the Valley. Uh, he's uh, uh, the CIO of Flex, which is one of the largest manufacturer, uh, manuf largest contract manufacturers in the world. Um, they, you know, uh, pretty much everyone, you know, from Apple to Google to uh, Palo Alto Networks, to pretty much everyone are, are in some ways customers of Flex. So we're very lucky to have Gus and Gus will be t uh, having a fireside chat uh, with um, none other than Mike Kepalas. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I think you go by Michael, right? So Michael. Okay, I sorry. I, oh, sorry about that. So Michael Kapalas, uh, you know, Michael Kapalas is, has had, had a very, very illustrious career. Um, right now he serves on the board of Cisco, where uh, uh, where um, he's a lead independent partner, uh, independent board member. He's also the chairman of Flex. So Gus and uh, Michael go a long way together. So I thought it'd be really good to see their chemistry. Uh, and uh, before that, Michael was, uh, uh, you know, CEO of several very large, uh, uh, very, um, you know, innovative and iconic corporations. So he brings a wealth of experience. Um, he, uh, he used to be the CEO of Compaq, then president of HP, um, as well as the CEO of WorldCom. So uh, lots of great experience. Also, Michael's been in the supply chain manufacturing um, space for a really, really long time, as well as been involved in companies like MuleSoft, where he's been an advisor. So very familiar with enterprise software, enterprise AI, and as well as the application of that in the, uh, in the world of atoms, all right? Uh, because supply chain has been one of the most important and one of the most interesting topics of late. Uh, so we thought that this uh, discussion would be very topical. So Gus, um, take it away. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Bindu. Great to be here again. And hello again, Michael. <laughs> good to see hello, you. Hello, Gus. How are you, sir? <laughs> great. No, uh, great to be here and, you know, happy to have that discussion around supply chain. Uh, you know, just for the audience, obviously Flex is in the middle of uh, the supply chain, really, we are physically in the middle of it, believe it or not. And so we're having those discussions with with the board and, you know, our senior leaders on a regular basis because it's super important for us. So maybe to keep it, I want to ask the, the million dollar, you know, just a high level question for the audience. Supply chain has become the hottest topic since COVID started maybe a few months after COVID. I think people started realizing some of the disruptions that are going on, shortages and so on and so forth. But maybe maybe you can give an overview from your perspective on, you know, what happened and why did supply chain go all the way to the top of everyone's agenda and why is it so important? Just just a high level overview for everyone here on this call, maybe. Well, sure, I'm uh, happy to do that. Uh, two quick comments. Uh, you know, when I am introduced to having done this for a very, very long time, it is a very, very long time. I sort of refer to myself as I've been around forever. Um, and, uh, and second comment, that was a really great panel right before us, by the way. Thanks to you guys. That was that was uh, that was good. Uh, so, you know, I think we've all kind of felt, it. you know, I mean, this is one of those things where, you know, there's so obviously, you know, incredible worldwide effect, but, you know, it's also one of those things that everybody who's, you know, either gone to the grocery store or tried to buy a refrigerator or heaven forbid, you know, uh, get a dishwasher installed uh, has felt it. And it, it, you, you kind of have to delve, even though, you know, it's always dangerous to, with 282 people you've never met before to, to delve into geopolitics, but you kind of have to start there. Um, and I would put this in kind of three great big buckets. The first one, is sort of a change in globalization. And, and this preceded the pandemic, uh, certainly was accelerated like so many things in the pandemic. I'll come back to that one. Uh, the pandemic itself, but not only the pandemic, the, the, the responses of governments around the world, including the stimulus. And the last one, anybody who's trying to run any kind of a business knows well, or trying to go to a restaurant or do anything else, is the labor shortage and, and what are the root causes of that. So. If we start with the first one, um, you know, 
the evolution of supply chain was so influenced by the rise of China and, and, and China as the manufacturing sort of hub of the world. And, and that existed because there was a real need or opportunity for arbitrage. You were arbitraging low cost labor, uh, Flex did this extremely well. Flex was kind of right at the, at the forefront. Um, and there was a reason why, you know, a skilled labor pool at low cost, you know, created advantage. Um, you could aggregate volume. And so there, we developed this sort of world of specialization with China uh, entering into that. And so we kind of had this basic theory, you know, companies would design and, and, and products and do what they were really good at, uh, but they would outsource the basic uh, 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 manufacturing components to China and, and elsewhere in Asia. And this created an efficient economy. And this was, you know, sort of the theory where Adam Smith had it. You had demand supply, and there was an optimization, specialization. Uh, before the pandemic started, you sort of got to the point where China more and more started uh, with the rise of its own economy, become a domestic supplier and domestic consumer. And so there was a sort of shift. Uh, the and as that economy developed, the arbitrage rates became lower. So, I mean, you know, the labor differential changed. And so we had a shift that was starting to develop in just globalization starting to decline. Uh, that was certainly accelerated by certain geopolitical decisions around tariffs and other things. And I'm not getting into politics right, wrong, or indifferent, just that there were, you know, uh, political factors entered it and changed what had been a kind of commercial arms leg relationship. And so, you know, the shift in globalization was really the start. And then you obviously have the pandemic and the pandemic had, you know, sort of, it is unlike other sorts of pressures that we've normally been through. So as the pandemic hit, we all know that production declined. Why did production decline? Because obviously, you know, mobility declined, people stayed home, people were out of the workforce. I mean, not too hard to figure out. But the enormous amount of stimulus, stimulus financial stimulus that was, was put in, into the market. And if you would watch, you know, sort of two charts with time, you'd see production and demand sort of, you know, move a little bit, but stay. And then as the pandemic hit, demand actually rose. I mean, you know, and, you know, it's humanitarian side, so I'm not being judgmental, but the US alone pumped over $5 trillion into a $22 trillion economy. And so demand continued to be stimulated as production declined. And so again, Adam Smith was right. Uh, demand started to exceed. And in the normal down cycle, you would have seen demand move production, but production was moving one way and demand was moving the other way. So that created an imbalance and the world's manufacturer China was heavily you know, buttoned up uh, um, for all the reasons that they felt were important to that country. And so you had the move in globalization starting to shift, the pandemic with a decline of production without the normal offset in demand that we would normally have, and you created a huge imbalance. Factor three was we were already getting into critical labor shortage. Um, remember heading into the pandemic, the world was constructively at full employment. And you know, but, you know, I'm a lot older than almost everybody in this room. Um, I don't actually want to take a poll to see if I'm the oldest because I don't really want to know the answer. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the first time certainly in my lifetime that we've been at full employment. So so now we enter in, into the pandemic, uh, labor short. Uh, we pull a lot of people out of the workforce. And, you know, roughly in the U.S. Uh, where, you know, you say you probably lost five or six million full-time jobs. And, you know, everybody has a study, but, you know, I think you look at part of it is just demographics and, and the aging of, of the baby boomer. So two to two and a half million people either retired or retired early. A million to a million two dropped out of the workforce because either they couldn't get, you know, childcare or were affected in pandemic and, you know, real humanitarian issues there. And probably another million were lost just out of change in immigration policy. So now you have full employment, rising demand, a lot of stimulus in the market, and you take five or $6 million, six million uh, people out of the active workforce in addition to less participation. So, you know, it, that seemed like an incredibly long-winded answer, um, um, but this was, you know, you have multiple factors at play. Uh, the interesting question is how long the healing period is and what that takes and, and you know, the reason why one of the natural economic outputs you get out is inflation, which has happens, you know, naturally when you have demand, which exceeds supply. 
And how you pull this back is you'll have to pull back by raising interest rates and sort of breaking the economy a little bit. And you know, whether that's a soft landing that looks like a U, a hard landing that looks like a B, uh, my gut reaction, it's a relatively soft landing, but, but, but now we'll sort of have the correction period that goes through. So um, there you go. My take on how the heck we got here. Um, and, I, and you still can't get a refrigerator, by the way. Yeah. No, that's great. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, like I said, we're, we're seeing it. And then, you know, one interesting discussion we often have, and, you know, you're involved in that, and I, and I know your opinion on that, is we see as demand started to go up, like, you know, it started going up quite fast, I would say. More often than not, we felt that customers are, you know, uh, giving us fake demand or, you know, they're just, you know, putting a lot of buffer in their demand. And, you know, we know their demand's gone up quite a bit, but how much of it is real? How much of it is they just want to secure supply? So they're beefing up their demand and all that. What's your, what's your thought on that? Because, there, you know, demand did go up for sure. Well, so let's look at the factual data because facts always kind of are interesting in here, although, you know, you, you could draw any conclusion through one fact. But uh, we know that inventories rose dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. And so you look at the balance sheet of any company. And, and, and so now why did that happen? Well, whenever you get in a constraint, um, everybody had more demand than they could ship. And so, and, you know, as we evolved the discussion about the future supply chain, where the opportunities exist for ML, um, by the way, which I am super excited about, mm -hmm. uh, as Gus will tell you. Um, mm -hmm. Gus has the uh, fortune of being the CIO and, you know, it, it, for every board meeting. Uh, so we talk about those guys. Can we see you know those 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 KRIs? Uh, so naturally, what happens when you have a multi-channel distribution network? You start with a customer who goes to some kind of distribution center, who goes up to some kind of aggregation center, who goes back to the OEM, who then backfills it into his contract manufacturer, and then backfills it into the supply base. And as the inefficiency that exists. At every point, you have demand. So what's you got to do? You're going to buffer that demand by adding more inventory. And when you're buffering that inventory on, on future demand, you know a couple of things are going to happen. One, you're going to get it wrong because you will never get the mix right unless you have really advanced ML tools, which is why we're all here. Yep. Uh, uh, and so the buffering in this inventory just completely exasperated this problem. So where the world sits now is, we're starting to see consumer demand soften, and and, and you know that's inherent in the numbers, and you know, uh, so we'll see some piece of that. But industrial demand has not backed off yet, and so how we bubble out of the artificial demand. But one of the things the pandemic and this supply chain crisis did do was it exposed the inherent weaknesses and and and, and deep you know sort of crevices in how traditional supply chains work, both from the globalization point of view, but the inefficiency in the, in the supply to demand match. And um, I, I don't, you know, you know, semiconductor is a great example. So now we sit not only with inventory, with a massive supply and demand mismatch. Um, you know, a lot of companies simply looked into their backlog and for a while will say, well, we'll margin optimize by shipping, you know, uh, one most critical components, but two where we make the most money. And so, that demand really got out of cycle. So we have a really, you know, globally, a serious demand supply mismatch, all still buffered by inventory that needs to get flushed. Um, yep. Yeah. So uh, not that, not, not that Gus and I have never discussed this problem before. Uh, yes. So that brings me to my, my next question. I mean, now that, you know, you gave a great explanation on, you know, what happened what's happening right now we still have a you know like you said an inventory issue supply and demand is a little bit out of whack companies are realizing oh you know they're not really that good at knowing what they're going to sell and the different mix and stuff like that uh you know data is key ai is key ml is key and you know we've been prototyping quite a bit here at flex with it because like i said you know we operate in so many different industries we have a lot of data we've actually been using abacus for a lot of that uh, what's your thought on, you know, are we going to be able to, is AI and ML really going to crack the code for us in our environment? I'm talking about, you know, flex being in the middle of this. And, you know, one of the challenges we had early on as Bindu knows, and you know, is, you know, once we come up with certain models for certain customers or certain SKUs, just trying to get those customers to even 
agree to look at that data and have a discussion with us was very difficult, right? It's a change in mind shift. It's a different way of looking at things. You know, customers would say, well, you know, the algorithm can't be more accurate than what my sales team is telling me or something like that, right? So what's your thought on all that and how do we approach that? So, so the first, there's a bunch of questions in there, yeah. so I'll sort of, I'll try to sort of unpack them. Um, the first really big picture question that's embedded in there is anything really going to change? And coming out of this, what will we see? And, and I'm gonna bundle this in sort of the category and I'll start high and eventually drill down. Um, so what does the next generation of the supply chain look like? And, 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 and what are the big fundamental changes that are gonna stick? Well, the first thing that's gonna stick is that we are gonna see a massive shift out of a global model to a regional and national model. And so you are gonna see the distribution centers change and people are going to be uh, shifting to that. One, because of geopolitics, the rise of nationalism, lots of things. But there's another reason for it is, uh, We've learned that you know the real competitiveness comes, and whether you were fond of Alibaba or Amazon or whoever your, your delivery of choices, is that quicker response time, particularly last mile quicker response time, now starts to become the competitive advantage. So we 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 have come out with a shift, more local, less global, quicker response times compressed. We're going to see these big broad distribution networks compress. A lot of companies got so badly burned, you're gonna see a lot more vertical integration. And so companies will start to sort of say, I can't necessarily trust so many suppliers. I mean, people will start to develop their own silicon um, uh, you, you, on and on and on down that cycle. And so what you're gonna see in that, in that, so what is required to make that better? And they're gonna get burned with inventory. So I do think this whole notion of demand management sort of becomes the holy grail and that does in fact become different. Um, and what has enabled that is the first thing we know is, you know, what, what makes ML go? I mean, you have to have a couple of basic ingredients. You have to have huge data sets, all right? So I don't need to tell anybody this room, oh, by the way, there's a lot of cell phones out there. It's a lot of machine to machine. IoT is actually real, you know, we got a lot of data. Okay, check, right? You know, you, know, you don't buy that one, we'll, we'll have a cup of coffee. Um, the second one is this fundamental shift in applications architecture. I mean, we do start to come out of this world where we're so constrained uh, by the traditional applications architecture where, you know, we kind of build applications that have APIs. And, you know, you know we talked about when I was chairman of MuleSoft and had that right with Greg. I mean, the view we had there is that you should be able to open anything up where an API could go open southbound so you can use any device or any infrastructure regardless of what cloud you wanted to use. Um, you'd be able to isolate the application logic and you'd be able to go northbound up and to call whatever services you want. And so you sort of had this world of a much more open set of APIs that allowed you to get access application, application device, device. And most fundamentally, there was a day when we built an application that had its own data set to open up a data set to any application. So, you know, what's changed? Well, one, there's a real burning desire to have to change the fundamentals of the supply chain because the customer requirements change. And we have the underpinnings of a different application artifact application with massive data sets. And so, you know, every big change I've ever been in, whether it was not working otherwise, has said there was a change in the business model with a combination of technologies that came together to create a different enable a different way to do things. And I think that's where we are with the inflection point of, 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 of ML um, in manufacturing. The data sets are there, the needs there, the applications have changed. We're ready to put the tool in place to now to monetize that. And I think the application, which is absolutely the whole holy grail is demand management. We will simply need to be able to find better ways and, and um, of determining you know, how you take demand, shape it, create it, manage it, and be able to have it as the front end driver, not only in your organization, but the really successful organization of the future will be able to use their upstream to be able to integrate other entities into it. Um, 
the large success of the companies that have really been sort of the in, in, in hyperscale delivery have done vertical integrations and they start with demand management. Right. Yep. No, that's great. Thank you for that. So, you know, on your uh, topic of regionalization, I want to just make a comment and maybe ask another quick question on that. So obviously we're seeing it, you know that we're seeing yep. big yep. shift and you're absolutely yep. right. Customers want to be closer to the end customer. That's yep. uh, that's happening fairly fast. But, you know, in, it, we're still struggling though, because there is a big chunk of the supply chain that still resides in China. Yes. And even though you're moving it closer to the customer, you still have to procure and bring everything in from China. So it make thing, makes things uh, more complicated. Uh, what's your thought on that? Will that change over time? And, you know, will, will Mexico and other areas closer to the U.S. market specifically start rebuilding some of those capabilities? And, uh, uh, just, you know. So it, it, it will happen. And I would even take a step farther. It fundamentally is far down the path. Um, you can look at some industries, uh, you know, one near and dear to my heart, you can look at the tech industry and, and you know well because um, mm -hmm. um, Flex has been the enabler of it. Um, an enormous amount of capacity moved that out and uh, out of China and, and in Mexico. You are starting to see, and I know it's probably, we'll touch on a little later, you're starting to see the revitalization of US manufacturing. Uh, I think I have my math right. In 2021, the U.S. added 350,000 manufacturing jobs, the largest increase in uh, 35 years. Um, yep. So you are seeing the research. And part of that is geopolitical. Um, and part of that is, is just closeness to customer. And part of it is the advancement of technologies have, have allowed companies which are technologically more sophisticated to build far more automated factories. And so... This bifurcation of movement, this, this is what I would have said about the cloud four or five years ago. This is not only a question of this is going to happen. It's going to, the only question is at the speed of acceleration. Correct. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. So talking about manufacturing in the U.S. and, you know, yep. obviously again, we're seeing that there's been a lot of talk about automation and, you know, automation, it, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, right? If you build an automated line for a certain product, the cost of reconfiguring that line sometimes for a different product uh, doesn't make sense and so on and so forth. So there's been a lot of innovation going into robotics and automation and all that. What's your thought on that? And, you know, cause that's something that's probably going to take off as well. Uh, you know, can you teach a robot to change, a, you know, from one product to the other a lot quicker? Uh, cheaper, more efficient, and so on and so forth. Because all, all that goes into play. And sometimes when you do the math, it's it's cheaper to hire labor, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I, I think there are a couple angles of this. I mean, um, I'm going to start again at a high level. Those companies with courage to change the model will win. And those companies who get bogged down in the short term will not. And the, you know, the building of automated factories um, is accelerating, um, and you know, without giving away any trade secrets here, you know, even within Flex or some other companies I'm associated with, we look at the productivity of our automated factories, and we compare them to those who aren't. And it, it is whether that's producing medical devices, drugs, or, or whatever. Um, the reality is, is that you know, those companies that will set up a building automated factories today with integrated models. And by the way, I don't even bother to answer the question about robotics anymore because I don't know what a robot is anymore. We have machine to machine capacity, full end to end line capability with the same integrated technology that allows you to do visual inspection. Uh, I mean, it, here's one that Gus will know. You walk down a factory in Malaysia that makes vacuum cleaners and you think you're walked into a rainbow because there's like every possible color. That factory has visual inspection at the end of the line, which is completely automated, that no human could do in the middle of Malaysia. It is real. There's not an automated factory, uh, which we produce a very high quality uh, end product. At, and we have four employees and three of them watch after the dog. Um, so we do have real examples of automated, but you have to have the courage to break out. It's, you know, to those of us who are in technology, or, uh, you know, you adopted the cloud early, you had a few bumps along the way. And if you didn't, you got left behind. And, you know, 
so this is simply the wave of the future. And, and we know this works. Um, yep. um, and so, yep. so it's just a question again of, of, do you get ahead of the adoption curve or you get behind it? Okay, am I frozen? I use, I use what, yeah, I use one other great example that I always like to use robotics. Um, to those who follow surgical robotics, the precision of surgery done by robotics now, and, and you know, if, I, if you're gonna have your, your eyes operated on, um, I'm gonna guess you want it automated as opposed to a, to a human anymore. So, I mean, if we get to the point where we can do full heart surgery and eye surgery, I do believe we'll be able to automate a warehouse. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep, I agree. Okay, so I'm gonna maybe cover a couple of more topics here. Driverless supply chain, you heard of that. Do you actually think, uh, you know, what's the role of it? Uh, optimization versus simula simulation versus forecasting. And, you know, which companies do you think are close to actually achieving a fully driverless supply chain. What's your thought on that? So, so one, is it gonna happen? Of course it's gonna happen. Um, uh, and you sort of ask the question, if you believe e-commerce is real, like have you ever bought anything on the web? Uh, uh, so what causes the, the fully integrated supply chain drivers to happen is that we actually, on the front end, start to be able to have far more horizontal uh, integration the front and the back end. If you get your demand signal right and you shape demand and you're able to perfectly execute and, and, and take the order and drive the order downstream, the manufacturing and delivery become a secondary until you get to the last part. So the middle part is not what's going to be the constraint. The middle part, which is the, which, which, which is the automation of the factory. What's going to drive this is our ability to front load the demand and be able to have far more predictive demand, average order, average demand accuracy across multiple industries right now, and you know this better than anyone because I'm on your case about all the time, is, is about 60%. So we get demand right, which means we miss 40%. The back end of the constraint is not getting that through the factory. We're, we're all quite good at that, is the fact that we can't optimize transportation on the back end and that we get caught in the transportation optimization of the last mile delivery. So, you know, and historically those have been done by very sep separate organizations. You had a retail organization that back ended in the manufacturing cycle, got all, 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 everything wrong on their demand forecast. And then by the time they got to the op optimization transportation, they got most of the transportation right and they could never get it to the last mile. So it, the companies that are gonna lead this are the ones that have done the best job of one, really having superior demand management on the front end and have become much more horizontally integrated. And we know who those are. I mean, Amazon clearly is leading the way. Uh, um, Alibaba outside the US is clearly leading the way. You've seen the other retailers. So a lot of interesting things in retail, um, the development. But the more vertically integrated you get, the less you're gonna have compression on, on reliance, the more horizontally integrated you're gonna get. So, you know, this whole question of end to end and how do you cross organizational boundaries? Who can be able to sort of create this with open APIs and, and these, these sort of horizontal data flows? And, and I think that's what makes it happen. It's not the middle. We can automate factories all day long. I mean, right. you know that as well as I do. But yeah. can you get the demand right on the front end? And can you find some way to far more efficiently um, predict that? Great. Okay, my, I'm going to switch uh, topics again here. Talk about this, uh, the CHIP Act that just went into, you know, was signed a couple of weeks ago and uh, you know what's your thought on that how's that going to have an impact us versus china manufacturing i mean there's a lot of talk about that see that as a question maybe it'll be good to get your thoughts on that you guys keep trying to drive me into politics um, <laughs> um so at the risk of not offending anybody here i first place let's look, look at you know i'm you know it's easy to sit in, in, in you know and throw darts um the recognition of the problem starts to be always important. I mean, you know, depending on what numbers you use, I mean, I think in the act that they quoted the number that U.S. share of of of, of, of some of that kind of chips is you know gone from thirty seven to twelve percent. Well, that's a little bit misleading, only because we do so much. You know, it's it's a large cycle. You know, we do different parts of the cycle, but the U.S. reliance um, 
on semiconductors from an almost captive source, and we all know, you know, the percentage of that's manufacturing Taiwan, it is a serious constraint. And we, you know, again, lessons we learned from the pandemic, uh, the constraint on on chips that just reverberated through everything from slowing down automobiles to uh, to every single end product, you know, um, uh, to advanced products like you know um, ion switches. So, acknowledgement of the problem is good. Um, money that has been spent, I think 100, 100 went to uh, the State Department sort of uh, to sort of have a long-term strategy about globalization of the world and which partners we can rely on and, and, and pledging up. Okay, that's good. There's some for pure research, that's good. There's a relatively small amount, I think it was 52 billion that, that went actually into tax credits. I don't, I think establishing a national policy, establishing some competency into it, establishing some pure, pure research are all positive things. I don't think we should look at it and say it is going to change the supply and demand equation or make the US more competitive. Supply and demand will do that on its own. Uh, industry will do that on its own. And, and ultimately, we have got some great leaders in our industry. I'm very close, as you know, to Lisa Sue, who is just doing a fabulous job. And so I, I don't look at that as anything uh, other than a signal, a set of direction, a policy that's important, and some long-term research, by the way, which is a perfectly fine way to set it. But I mean, I, I just wouldn't put any, there's no magic bullet here, and this isn't one. Great. Okay, so back to uh, AI and ML, which is our topic. So yeah, like you said, the data is there. I think we're going to get more and more mature in it. I think we're going to be able to get so much better at it with the help of uh, AI and ML. Question to you is, would you think that, you know, let's say 10 years down the road, we're super mature, we've got all these models, things are running great, were heavily reliant on technology to manage supply chains, would we have been able to predict something like, like a pandemic or something? Because, you know, we get questions every time I'm talking to people in the network. Hey, do you guys have, you know, do you think you would have predicted something like COVID? I mean, you know, when you talk AI and ML, a lot of times you use them for predicting things before they happen so you can react, right? Do you think this is something that could be predicted by looking at different things and What's your thought on that? So I'll give you, again, I've been around forever. Mm -hmm. So so I, some of you will have to get out history books to figure this one out, but, but just you and me. Um, go back 20 years. So, all right, we can do that math pretty quickly. It's 2002. So um, we were working on a project with Dr. Ventner um, to crack the human genome. So the problem we had at the time is that we didn't have enough compute capacity um, to be able to run the models and distribute the models. And, you know, and so, um, you know, we finally concluded that we would need this combination of data scientists, heavy intensive compute power and domain experts in biology to solve the problem. So we went about trying to solve the human genome, which said it could be done. Um, and by the way, first application of a 64-bit processor that showed you how long ago this was, right? Uh, made by digital equipment, an alpha chip. First application. Of that. So uh, we cracked the human genome. The first one cost us about $56 million. I think that cost us $56 today or $5.60. I used to use an example of that. So, so I have no doubts that what we have in the size of the data sets that our ability to simulate and use ML to do this because the, what's ML about is building a learning model against massive data sets. And yes, I have absolutely no doubt that we were able to do that. Or even if you want to think positively, think about the amount of time it took us to, to, to develop a vaccine uh, for what we have now. Now, was it perfect? No, did it save, you know, fill in whatever number of lives you want. But think about from the point where we were first identified to a vaccine and through distribution, by the way. Um, now, sure, a lot of people were left behind and, and, you know, and, and there's lots of things we could have done on social causes better. But just the pure science of it, 
and the relative speed of the development of the vaccine due to historic effect. And a lot of that was done through ML tools and through the, and through the modeling and the massive data sets that we have to be able to do that. So, I mean, you know, my view of, of, of what it really takes to make ML, ML is a use case more than it is a technology. And it's having the, the fundamental underpinnings, the data, the application architecture to have openness to it, the design of the use case, and the application of that use case. And then, you know, then you have the multiplier effect downstream because the, once you have the use case in place, then it takes you places you have never been before. And, 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 but this is a classic use case. And I have absolutely certain, given the, the size of the data set and, and, and the domain experts that, that we will ultimately be able to model, to model a pandemic. We may even be able to develop the vaccine before, before we even know that the disease exists. Yep. No, that's a great point on the vaccine. Uh, absolutely. 100% agree. Okay, Michael, we've got about 250 people here on, you know, in this pan in this uh, webinar, and we've got like, you know, they're all passionate about AI and ML, some of them experts, of course, what advice would you give them, you know, being uh, obviously I don't want to say jack of all trades, but your expertise is, is very broad, very strong in supply chain, uh, very strong in manufacturing, of course. Uh, you know, what's if you were to give them some advice, what would it be here uh, for this group here in terms of you know how to take it to the next level? And so, so I'm going to answer this question a little bit backhanded, and. Um, you know, I'm going to do this because this is something I kind of went through in my head and preparing for this. Um, this, you know, again, every once in a while you get to be in the inflection point in the industry. And I've been through, you know, a bunch of them. Um, I remember the first time we built an IP network said, what do you mean you could create a network without having anything underlying underneath it? And of course that gave way to, you know, when we first created the IP networks to, you know, this explosion of wireless and everything. Um, um, first application of parallel processing that I got was involved in. And every once in a while, uh, the cloud, but every once in a while, you uh, you get in one of these inflection points. You are at one of these inflection points. And and I'm going to offer a little bit of advice. So I've sit on a whole bunch of boards. You know, I've been, including I was been a chairman of Louis there was mm -hmm. in the yep. Cisco. And so what I went through and I went back and I sort of said, okay, Let's take real life examples of where this works because all this can be, you know, theoretical. Um, and so, you know, we talked about demand management. We, one of the companies I'm with, we, we built, you know, grocery has got huge spoilage. It's had 60% spoilage forever and 60 percent accuracy. We discovered through, you know, sort of the modeling that if we simply took every local event, local store, and instead of building the optimization model by aggregating, we could, took it down to the SKU, took in weather, took in the store, and took in local events that an ML model could actually raise it by, by almost 25 points. That's a real case study from a large grocery store across Europe. Mm -hmm. And what did they have? Well, certainly they had some good data scientists, but they had data scientists to work together with the end use, with the use case and the domain experts. And there is a classic case. Everybody knows Michelin Tire. Michelin Tire would go through and how they forecasted was they went historically, they looked at each distribution center, they took a prorata across of what it was, they applied a judgment factor, they then missed by a mile, and what did they do? They buffered the store with inventory. So they built an ML model that simply said for every single zip code, they would take the type of car, the weather patterns determine what factor on wear and tear. And they build a model in Michelin that unbelievably reduced not only their ability to demand, but then be able to cut almost all the inventories out of the store. And so again, very practical case. Um, we're gonna to come to call Converge One. You ever call a call center is the most miserable experience in the world. You know, dial one for it, it's a miserable experience. So if you don't know how a call center works, a lot of people do here. What's the first thing the call center does statistically? It says, can I understand the question? If I hit 80%, I'll pass you to it. Do I have an answer? 
And then it gives you a stack answer. By that time, you know, if you were sales, you had no context of it. So we actually build an ML model, which was able to go and take each of the intersections with the customer and sort of say, build a model around which was far beyond logistics that actually sort of says, I know what the customer is, I know what he wants. And all of a sudden I can make call centers automated. And again, you know, real model we built. Um, Cisco uh, and security. You know, we used to do security by doing deep packet inspection. And that's how we were able to call security. Well, when we encrypted, guess what happened? No packets to inspect. And so you shifted through an ML model about being able to do the behavioral characteristics of, of, of the packet as it flowed through the network. And again, so, and then back in, after that model worked, you said, well, then I can actually go through and build a model around behavior. So I'll bet I can guess for almost anybody in the room, what key they hit the hardest. You know, key you hit the hardest? Keyboard, you know which one you hit the hardest? I can tell you. Which one? G. Almost everybody hits the key of their first name the hardest. And so by building a, a, an analytical model with a, with a security company, we were able to determine that we could, by judging the human characteristics of your use case after you signed in, you know, reduce the level of flood. Again, a math model. An interesting one in a healthcare company, I'm on the board of Beauty Health. Uh, this one I have no idea, you know, out of my domain. So we do facial treatments and there's a device that is clean. So, so we now gather the data off the sensor as the facials be doing to be able to identify the serum. It goes back into the product development and is able to actually give a loop back into the product development cycle. Another company I'm worth, we're, we're doing, you know, uh, I'm not gonna pick on Microsoft here, it's a great company, but what percentage of Excel do you use? Like two? Oh yeah. So yep. we have developed some models that go through and for a feature set, go through each feature set, optimize how much of the feature set it's used through the correlation of cross feature set and dynamically feedback uh, the development. So what is what is my lesson to everybody? Um, this time has come. The time has come. We have the data, we have the tools. And you're only constrained by your ability to have collaboration with the domain experts and their users. And, you know, they there are real life, enormously successful models being built. And we haven't yet had the multiplier effect, of course, is as the model learns and becomes, becomes more sophisticated and accurate, which you know, everybody in this room knows about. We don't really know what the downstream multiple effect is of what will happen as our learning models start to go. So, but you know, there is just opportunity existing everywhere and only, you know, you're limited only by your creativity to apply it. You know, you know, it's kind of, you know, when you, you sit at the chairman, you know, it's a lot easier to say than do when you kind of, you know, have a real job every day. But the opportunity is absolutely about. And, and uh, I, you know, sort of my advice for it is, boy, you're at an inflection point, just go for it. Yep. Uh, perfect. Yep. I agree. No, thank you so much for that. So, you know, we're coming up to the top of the hour. I don't know, Bindu, I can hand it up. I mean, if, hand it back to you we can continue chatting for a few more minutes how do you want to it's up to you i mean maybe take some questions from yeah. i mean if there are questions go for it yes uh we want to like probably like uh you know kind of end around like 12 so yes if you have okay. yeah. yeah so uh, uh well i'm gonna quickly okay, breast here so we can end a little bit early too because i know you yeah, yeah, no, I, there is one question here, Michael, that uh, when we talked a little bit about automation and stuff, a uh, question is how do you compensate for all the jobs uh, that you lose? I, I mean, I know your opinion on that, but maybe you wanna give them a quick update on that. It, yeah, so sometimes again, one of these historical references, think pre-cloud days, if anybody, no, I remember pre-cloud days, maybe everybody in the room does. Remember pre-cloud days, pre and if you think about the advances that we have made over the last 10 years, unbelievable productivity, unbelievable advances in technology, self-driving cars, you name it. You know what? Somehow we ended up at full employment. And so the, the reality is, is one could look around. And so you can answer that two ways. One is 
we kind of miss the the advances of the acceleration of what happens. Um, and so, you know, we we still haven't applied the technology we have to solving some really, really hard human problems. We should be able to re reinvent education. We should be able to be able to you know, you stop hunger. So, I mean, there, there's so many causes, but I, I, you know, the reality is, is technology applied has never ceased to the point where the more technology we have, you know, I mean, technology is simply in the last 30 years, we've added 12 years of life expectancy, which is absolutely astounding, a lot driven by technology. And so I, I, I look at it more of an opportunity than a threat. And, and you know, the point we ever get to, it becomes a threat, but hell, we'll just all work the four day work week. Yep, exactly. Great. Well, hey, I think Bindu, I think we're yeah. wrap, you know, this wraps up. And again, Michael, great seeing you as always. I'm going to be talking to you here in a week or so anyway, but uh, as always, great chatting with you. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, thank you so much for uh, doing this podcast and Michael, uh, very much appreciate it.